appropriate as we come and celebrate the life of Walter Conrad Hughes, Sr. I thank you for being here. Walter was born on June 12th, 1936. 21st. On June 21st. 21st. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. You just be like my wife. Uh, I'm used to it. Uh, my dyslexia come in. So, June 21st, 1936. Went to be with the Lord April 16th, 2023. And as I come and I share these scriptures as we start, these were shared at his wife Yvonne's service just about a year ago as we celebrated her life. And so as I read Ruth, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, this is chosen because really Walter and Yvonne were inseparable. Rarely were they apart, always together. And it says, but Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. And in John 14, 1 through 7, it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. <clears throat> Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going, Thomas said to him. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. And now, Curtis Hughes comes and shares Sweet Beulah Land. <laughs> Good to see each one of you here today, and thank y'all for being here for our brother, for our daddy, and everything else. So I want to sing a song. The song I want to sing is called "It's True." Hope you listen to the words of the song. How someday we'd live again He held his Bible to his chest As he slowly slipped away Before he took his final breath I heard our brother say It's true I can hear the angels singing It's true Heaven's bells are ringing I can see the face of my Jesus He's coming for me It's true I see loved ones who are waiting It's true Things of earth are fading I'll be waiting on the other side for you, it's true. I know that there will come a day when death will call for me. They will put my body in the ground. That's not where I'll be. When I have those fears and doubts, about what lies ahead I 
just think about my dear old brother The last two words he said It's true I can hear the angels singing It's true Heaven bells are ringing I can see the face of my Jesus, he's coming for me. It's true. I say, Lord, ones who are waiting, it's true. Things of earth are fading. I'll be waiting on the other side for me. It's true. Friends and loved ones, you believe Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. If you believe that, one day we're going to see our loved ones again. I see God, and I see God. And I see my Jesus called this true. comes and after him Pamela will come and share a word. I broke back in line. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about our brother and we were little bitty boys, uh, twins, and Judy, our sister, and our brother looked after us. I remember a lot about Connor when he was little and Harry's gonna share the rest of it. But we were real little. He went off to service. And I remember one night, we, Mama called us out on the front porch. We ran out of the seat. It was Connor, he was hidden in the bushes. <laughs> when he saved us through dawn, and he jumped out of us and just surprised us so much. And we loved him dearly. But I remember another thing, too. He would always, uh, excuse me, Judy, my sister got on to me about me wiping my nose with my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember he sent us a record home, a record player. Mama had put it in there and play it for us. And it was the shrimp boats are coming. And me and Harry sat there on the floor. We'd try to sing it. We'd dance that little song. <laughs> then right after the end of it, he said, you little boys be good to Mama and Daddy. We always tried to be. <laughs> He wants me to try to talk. <laughs> Most of you folks in here, you Walter Hughes. But that wasn't who he was to us. When Carter, 1936, Daddy was driving a bus to Trailways, and they lived in Newton, Georgia. And Mama had gone to Granny's and Papa and Granddaddy's in Argyle for the baby to be born. And Daddy came in late that night in Newton, Georgia, two hours from Grandma, from Mama. And there was an old Jewish man that had a dry goods store there. And Judy said, Aunt Bale, Johnny Gill's case, Mama worked with him. But anyway, he, Daddy didn't have a car to get to her. And he asked a man if he'd take him to Argyle. And he said he would after store closed. The man's name was Benjamin Kahn. And on the way, he told Daddy, he said, my wife and I hadn't had any children. He said, if you'll name him after me, he'll never want for anything. <laughs> and I'll pay for his college. And Daddy said, this is our first child. We can't do that. <laughs> so they used part of his name. He was named the first name, Walter, after Daddy, and then Conrad after Benjamin Kahn. Hmm. And every time, Vaughn did real good because when all the family came from South Georgia up here, it was always Conrad. When she was around everybody else he worked with, it was always Walter. <laughs> but when he went south, it was our, it was Conrad. So that's how, how we uh, got his name, and that's what we called him, and that's what we knew him by, because we'd have had two Walters just like he did when he named Walter after him. <laughs> um, 
How many in here took the first airplane flight with Connor? You remember what it was like? Yeah. Mine was better than y'all's. <laughs> I was in Douglas, Georgia, probably 10 or 11 years old when they were living over there. And we went to this hangar to roll the old plane out. And there was a rabbit in the corner of the hangar. So me being a Hughes and a James descent, <laughs> wasn't nothing to do but catch that rabbit. <laughs> so I caught that little rabbit. He was about half grown, and we got in the plane, and we flew. And I don't know who was the scaredest, me or the rabbit. <laughs> but Connor flew us over Argyle and everything. We came back, and I put him back right where I got him from. <laughs> Mine was different. Uh, Connor Nebon lived everywhere. They, uh, Fleetwood was good at moving them. It was like the military. And uh, they were in Roswell, Georgia. They were in Riverside, California, Emporia, Kansas, Marshall, North Carolina, and ended up back at Rocky Mount. But uh, Mom and Daddy went where the kids were. And Connor and Yvonne always had projects. So during the day, Daddy would help Yvonne on the projects while Connor was at work. And uh, I even got into a few projects up in Marshall trying to put out fence posts with them. But the shortest trip I ever made to visit with them was in Galleon, Ohio. I was in a Navy station at Norfolk, and Mom and Daddy, Mama said, we're at Codridge and the Bonds in Galleon, said, why don't you just fly in over there? So I was coming to South Georgia, so Connor and Yvonne picked me up in Cleveland about 7 o'clock at night. We drive to the house. I remember walking in the front door, seeing the kids and everybody. And Mama said, we're leaving at 6.30 in the morning because <laughs> I want to go home. So when Mama got ready to go, she'd go visit. But when she was ready to go home, she was ready to go home. So that was the shortest place I ever visited. Um, in uh, Connor and Nevon had the Caffers and stuff, and I remember they always come by and get them to go somewhere when Jennifer and Terry got married. They, we were down there in Orlando at the wedding, and they came back, and they went out west, and they stayed gone for two weeks and took them to all the canyons out there and the Yellowstone and everything and come back. And then probably in 90 or so, early 90, they took them to Maine, places Mom and Daddy wouldn't ever, probably wouldn't have gotten gone, you know, if it hadn't been for Vaughn and Connor. But, uh, in Exodus 20, which is in the word of the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The Fifth Commandment says, Honor thy father and mother, that, their days may be, that thy days may be long on, on the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Connor and Yvonne was faithful <clears throat> to Sadie and Mr. Barker down there and, and, and Mom and Daddy. They tried to take care of them when they could and do things. So Connor followed that fifth commandment. And God did his part too because they gave him a long time on this earth. Uh, in Connor's obituary, you read about all the things he accomplished and everybody he tried to help and he started new things for people and did all those things. Um, and Terry shared last night about a friend of his that he helped. And we'll never know, but God knows. And Jesus, in Matthew 22, 37 and 40, there was a lawyer talking to him. And he asked Jesus, he said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said unto him, that love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I believe Connor did that. He and Vaughn throughout their lives 
love thy neighbor as thyself. In Proverbs 22 and 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. And I know that Yvonne and Connor were trained up by their parents. And I got to say something about that bunch of barkers, okay? <laughs> Sometimes when you marry into a family, you just get a sister-in-law or brother-in-law. We got to claim them too. <laughs> we spent a many a day down there on the river. And since, that, since Connor and Yvonne got married, they have not just been Conrad's in-laws. They have been our family. Amen. Amen. And we loved every one of them and still do. And uh, I know where my brother is. And I'm looking forward. I told somebody the other day, I know he and my got in. I just want to get across the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote like 50 pages of memories about daddy, so I hope y'all ate. <laughs> but um, I got a ton of stories while I find my way here. Um, my mama didn't stand a chance. Not only was daddy incredibly handsome, he was incredibly smart and incredibly persistent. He proposed to her three times <laughs> before she said yes. And she almost blew it. At her sister's wedding over Thanksgiving, Daddy cooked beside her mama overnight the Thanksgiving dinner. And she fell in love with him. But when Daddy and Mama went to pick up the wedding cake, Daddy took the curve too fast, and the cake kind of hit the side of the car. <laughs> so she told her mama, I'm not going to marry that man. And she said, Mama, Grandma said, you get your butt in there and marry that man. <laughs> so thank you, Grandma. And Daddy loved to cook, so that's where you got it from. It's the one reason I'm alive. And um, <laughs> seriously, in more ways. Because he fed me at the end there. I, couldn't, I haven't eaten since he left me. So I don't know. Oh, God, I like it yet. Um, nobody gets more perfect than my dad. I'm sorry. Mama had to learn many of the lessons the hard way. First, she could never say anything was pretty. If she did, Daddy would buy it for her. And she went back to try to show her friend that pretty thing in the window, that pretty thing was gone, and she knew where it was. <laughs> um, another hard lesson is don't ever tell Daddy something needs to be done or be fixed, because he'll get up and he'll do it right then. If you don't want it done right then, don't tell him anything. because. He doesn't know anything about procrastination. <laughs> he never put anything off. And the honey-do list didn't exist in our house. Um, when I was a little girl, Mama used to tell me, you're going to throw my daddy away. And I would come up with all these reasons why she had to keep him. And she thought that was funny. I think that was child abuse. <laughs> but <laughs> I came up. She would call them excuses, and I'd call them reasons. And if anybody was going to leave the house, it was going to be her. <laughs> um, my daddy was unlike any man I've ever met anywhere. He was sentimental. It's usually the women that would send out the cards and Christmas cards and all that. Daddy had to do it. He sent out emails. I, how many people got his emails? <laughs> his holiday emails. But um, he wrote... When mom died last year, I searched her house for all her treasures. And the treasures that I was looking for, because I got to see him a couple of times, or one or two, he would write her love letters. And he would just express all the emotion that he had for her, and just was so sweet. But I would have put him in the safe, but she had them between books and boxes. <laughs> I had to look pretty hard. <laughs> but now they're all in the same place. But um, the day after daddy died, I looked in his little cabinet thing, and I found an envelope that said Daddy, and I instantly... <laughs> it 
there was a letter I wrote when I was 20 something <laughs> where I told him how much I loved him and why I loved him and I couldn't afford to get him a gift but he was the greatest man I ever knew. I was going to bring it and read it but I'd cry of course. <laughs> but he kept that little letter that I wrote him as a birthday present for decades. I can't think of anything else I gave him that he would point to and he kept it. But he kept it where he saw it every day. Um, <laughs> it just touches me. Um, now I'm going to tell y'all some stories. I'm just not going to. My mama, if y'all were here last year, she, she made one last request where she asked me to take care of daddy and keep an eye on him. And here's some of the things that's happened in the last year. <laughs> He called me on the phone. He said, Pamela, I need you up at the shed. So I go out and I look up. He had cut down a dogwood tree and it had fallen on the shed. He had the ladder, ladder leaning up against the shed. He climbed that ladder. He's standing on top of that shed. He's 86 years old, standing on top of that shed. He's got my reciprocal saw and he's cutting limbs. And then I noticed he's wearing his bedroom slippers. I was like, Mama, <laughs> I can't keep an eye on him. Um, but he, you know, he liked to be doing things. He, that was the thing that bothered him the most when he couldn't get around good. He wanted to be doing things. But at least he loved to read. He could read two or three books a week. Just thank God they got him digitally. It would be at the library every day. But um, then there was the, and I have video to prove it, we were hauling his cooker on the back of the trailer, and we had, we had barbecued, and we thought the fire was out. We took off down the road. Daddy's, Daddy's driving, and he says, there's a fire back there. I thought he meant it was, there was fire in the smoker. And, uh, we had a cart of wood, and a spark hit it, so that cart of wood was on fire. <laughs> and the shed was, he pulls over. And I'm taking video of him. He's like, are you going to help me? I said, yeah, but this is way too funny. <laughs> then I grabbed the, the cooler water and threw on it. And we thought we'd put it out, but we'd go further down the road. He goes, it's on fire again. <laughs> so we pull, we pull over. And this man stopped behind us. He had a fire extinguisher. <laughs> Who cares one of those in their car? <laughs> but that was perfect. That, you did? Randy. <laughs> Randy's one of the perfect people. Um, <laughs> Daddy um, and I took two road trips to South Georgia to see Mama's family and his. And um, we were going to stay two weeks this last time, and he just said, oh, I need to go home. And so we just went to Harry's house and stayed there a couple of days, and then we went, came on home. But um, he had a CD in the car from Alan Jackson, and there was a song called I'll Fly Away. And we both just, we remembered it and we were singing it at the top of our lungs. That song is perfect for Daddy because he loved to fly and he was ready to get to heaven and he was ready to see Mama. And we would talk about this, about him dying and all, and I said, and he said, I want the same service your Mama had. I want people smiling and laughing. I want the music. I don't want any sad, crying people. And um, I said, okay, Daddy. And I said, what's your favorite hymn? Same one, How Great They Are. <laughs> I was like, okay, we'll sing that. <laughs> but then I'm going to stick uh, I'll Fly Away in there because that's real joyous. Um, the only complaint I have about Daddy is that the last day, where's Johnny? As he's leaving Johnny, we had a great Saturday and a Friday. Friday, he took a four-generational photo with Missy, Mackenzie, Walter, and him. And then I found a picture of Papa, Walter, Daddy, and Missy. When Missy was a baby, I was like, how perfect was that? And then Saturday, he got to see all four grandchildren, great grandchildren. And we're sitting at the dinner table, and he starts to cry. And Missy or Carrie went over there and hugged him. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? He was sitting right next to him. I didn't see he was crying. So as we're driving home, I said, Daddy, why do you start to cry? He goes, I'm a blessed man and have lived a blessed life. Amen. And Amen. he just loved his family, loved God, loved my mama, 62 years and 139 days. 
but he's continued to love her all year long. We missed her horribly, but he would hug me every day. And I'm gonna miss that. I miss him cooking for me. But um, he did ask Johnny as he's walking out the door. He goes, Johnny, we need to fix that dock. Are you gonna come help me this summer? Mm -hmm. and Johnny said, yes, sir, as soon as my, because he's got knee surgery, as soon as my knee heals up, that dock is tore apart <laughs> and it's left for me to do. So I might need some help. Jason, where's Jason? <laughs> where's your hand, Jason? Jason's her. <laughs> he does talk. Daddy even asked him about that, so we gonna have to do that. But um <laughs> anyway. I don't want to keep you for a couple of years to tell you all the wonderful things about my father, but um, I will tell you one last story, because he would keep an eye on his children. If you flew, you had to give him your itinerary, he would follow you on flight aware, and then where your plane took off, and if it was late or landing, and he had to know where you were, he'd use Google Earth to spy on you. <laughs> Jessica's over there in Ireland and he's like looking at where she's living and where she's working. And I was like, it's not live. It's not real time. <laughs> I just want to make sure it was a good place. But <clears throat> back in the days when car phones were actually mounted in the car and the only thing they did was take and make phone calls. That's all it did. It didn't have GPS or anything. I was sat at home, went up 95, turned left on I-26 and started, and it was the middle of the night because I'm a night out. No lights anywhere, I run out of gas. The little light for the gas thing burned out right then. So I'm sitting in the middle of nowhere, can't see any lights anywhere, just the stars and the heavens, that's it. And I called Daddy on the phone. I said, what am I gonna do? I can't call 911 because I don't know where I'm at. And he said, call 911 and tell them you're on I-26 and you're headed west and they will find you. So I did. And eventually the, the cop showed up. I got in the car with him to go to the gas station. Dispatcher gets on the phone. Do you have Pamela Hughes in the car with you? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And he said, yeah. How did daddy find me when I didn't know where I was? But he found the cop car going down the road that I was in. I mean, we had no GPS, no idea how long I'd been on I-26, but he could find me wherever I was and he was always there for me. And he was always there for all of us. And he loved his family more than I could even tell you. But he loved Mala and he loved the Lord and that's where he's gone. He didn't want anybody crying. So let's stop crying and sing how great they are. Y'all ready? All right. Master. Could you guys stand as we sing together? <laughs> oh my God, when I lost some wonder, consider When Christ shall come, 
wish your acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. And now Terry is going to speak. <laughs> Walter and Conrad, how that happened. The Navy, when he joined the Navy, they asked him what his name was. He said he was Conrad Hughes, and they looked at his paperwork and said, you're Walter Hughes. And so he was Walter Hughes from that day forward, so I just got set that up and let you know that. Um, when we were planning this, my job was the Fleetwood family, and that's what you were. But I'm also going to take a moment and give you a little Walter Hughes history. I got bullet points up here and I know this stuff by heart and I was going to do it by um, just looking at the bullet points and doing it off the cuff. But Sydney said y'all didn't have that much time. <laughs> and from scripture, I think this is probably the most appropriate for what I'm going to share with you today. It's from Mark 9.35. And setting down, Jesus called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. I want to tell you about the Walter Hughes I knew. In 1967, we lived in Douglas, Georgia. Dad was a loan officer at the Douglas Savings and Loans. One day of, while he was working the counter, a man came in and he handed Daddy a check to deposit. When Dad inspected that check, he looked up at the man and said, how can I make this kind of money? And the man had him a business card. And in 1968, he went to work for Fleetwood. That same year, Fleetwood Homes of Rock, in Rocky Mountain, or Fleetwood Homes of Virginia, opened. In the winter of 1969-70, Dad was promoted to sales manager of Westmoreland, Tennessee. We went all the way to Westmoreland, Tennessee. We were inspecting a new home. We were waiting for our furniture to arrive, and Dad got news that the roof had collapsed. So Fleetwood sent him on to Galleon, Ohio, and rerouted our furniture so we never moved in to Westmoreland, Tennessee. We spent two years in Galleon, Ohio, and my mom was not fond of the cold. <laughs> uh, that, after two years of trying to get them Fleetwood to move him back, they failed to do so. He went to work for Boise Cascade. Uh, in 1972, he went to their uh, went to one of their factories and got quickly promoted to uh, the corporate headquarters. In 1972, we moved twice. In 1973, Fleetwood called again, and Dad became the division sales manager in Riverside, California. In 1974, Gerald Ford became the first president until Joe Biden to never be elected to office. He, we had an oil embargo, we had hyperinflation of 12.3%, and the stock market crashed. And by 1975, Fleetwood closed three of four divisions, and Dad was a hatchet man. He was a man that had to go tell everyone that they no longer had jobs. In 1976, we moved to Marshall, North Carolina, where Dad was a sales manager. He brought a farm, and my Uncle Harry and I fenced in 40 acres. I had never seen so many rocks until I moved to Rocky Mountain, Virginia. We raised chickens, ducks, and had a two-acre fish pond. 
and a wonderful dog named Doc. And I rode my motorcycle constantly. In 1978, we made our 12th move. We moved to Emporia, Kansas, and Dad was the general manager of a struggling modular factory. It was there that, where Dad's production manager introduced the Peacework Pay Program. It was a good time for Dad and me. We duck and pheasant hunted, and he had a Fleetwood Van conversion that he bought when we were in California, and I was the lucky one. I only went to two different high schools. I graduated from Emporia, and Dad got a call. They told him that the company's top general manager was leaving the company because of the uh, cancer diagnosis, and he was going to be the new GM in Plant City, Florida. But there was a but, and that but was they had a thief, and they wanted Dad to find him. So they sent him here to Rocky Mount, Virginia. He had his camping gear and a telephoto lens. He picked and scouted out the factory and decided that he would set up camp behind the railroad spur on the back of the factory. And he sat there and observed the factory with his telephoto lens from his little campsite. He stayed up all Friday night. And halfway through Saturday morning, he felt that he was a failure. He had failed to find the thief. When a truck and a trailer pulled to the back of the set of the lot on the, at the factory, the general manager was building a home on Smith Island Lake, and he was using Fleetwood Lumber to do it. So Dad turned in his findings, and he returned to Rock. He returned to Emporia, Kansas. Um, there he and mom made a decision. Mom would move one last time and dad would never move her again. Come what may. He called Fleetwood with his decision. He told Fleetwood he wanted the newly vacant general manager job in Rocky Mount, Virginia. And they said, Walter, it is not profitable and will most likely close that factory. We're giving you our number one factory, go to Plant City. He said he could make Rocky Mount work, and he had seen enough people lose their jobs. In mid-1981, the corporate office told Dad the factory was going to close. And Dad said, no, there's nothing wrong with this factory, there's nothing wrong with this team, it's the product. He said, you let me build what I want, and we can make money. And he wanted to build nothing but single lines. And so the company felt, well, this would be a decent experiment. And they literally gave him basically six months' time to turn it around. So he met with his management team. And I'll tell you something you won't believe about Fleetwood. They wouldn't allow you to have a computer in the factory. <laughs> So he bought a Macintosh with a line printer and he stuck it in a broom closet and he told the secretary, if anybody from corporate shows up, you lock that computer up. <laughs> that was her job. But he sat at that computer and using variable costs and fixed costs, and Tom, I know you know what I'm talking about, he figured out what it would take to build, able to build nine homes a day where they could make some money. So he went to the sales team, and Bob Atkins is part of that team, and he told him, he said, look, we need to get to nine homes a day. And like all sales teams, which I'm a member of, they started complaining about the price. And Dad told him, well, I'm going to price the homes as if we were already building nine homes a day. Now can you do it? And they got to work. And I, <coughs> the next meeting was with the plant personnel. The clearest, most obstructed view that you could have in the factory is in the floor department. He stood on the floor of a unit and he called this meeting, and they call this a floor meeting to this day. Dad hated the word employee. He had everyone referred to as an associate. He had a floor meeting where he explained a piecework pay program and told them that if they could build more houses in the same time, that they could make real good bonus money. And he asked them, he said, can we do it? And they replied, yes, we can. And they did. In 1982, they had a new problem. He met with his management team, and he informed them that they could make a million dollars and a quarter. 
It had never been done at a Fleetwood factory. And what I'm about to tell you is kind of stupid too, but they penalized you if you made more than 800000 So it was a decision for the team. He met with the team and he told them what the problem was. And they said, let's do it. And they became the first factory in Fleetwood history to make a million dollars in a quarter. And they did it on a regular basis. There are industry legends that came out of that group. People like Sonny Cooper, Bob Atkins, Steve Collins, and Jimmy Holmes, and Dan Bryant, just to name a few. There are too many to mention here. I heard about him. I heard about what y'all did from my daddy. And I love you. My daddy taught me many things. He said, hard work pays off. Most of the things he would tell you is like, be good to it on the way up, it'll be good to it on the way down. And that scripture is, you reap what you sow. He told me to build, eat the frog first. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> that factory began to not build 19 homes a day. And he bought a bounder and he drove it up to the top of the plant and parked it up there so that he could be there available for his team. In 1983, I was the manager of Border Drive Away here in Rocky Mountain when my oldest daughter was born. And we lived on Diamond Avenue. And Dad wanted to see his grandbaby, so he loaded his riding lawnmower up in my mom's truck, came over to my house Saturday morning, and he was mowing my grass at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and I got up, and I was like, what's going on? I went out, and there's my dad mowing. And he goes, is she awake? I said, yeah, she has to be awake. You drove by her window six times. <laughs> he said, yeah. Well, climb on, take over, I'm going to go see my baby. <laughs> and that's what he did. He went into see Sydney. Dad and Mom came to fence the backyard when we moved to Indiana. Ten-month-old Sydney banged her head on the fence, posed in protest. <laughs> Us Hughes like our freedom. <laughs> Sydney loved her motorhome, and when she went missing, we found her trying to open the front door. Incidentally, I couldn't work for Fleetwood while Dad was there. In 1994, Dad retired to a refuge on Smith Mountain Lake. He credited the lake with helping him live through the stress. It was his retreat. It was where he went to recharge and rest. He loved to fish and he loved to take people fishing. He was proud to have family and friends in his home. Dad and Mom, curse, I give them that. Or should I tell Judy? <laughs> Dad and Mom loved to, <coughs> they loved the boundary, they loved to see the com country. <coughs> they were heading to Alaska, the last state they needed to see in their boundary when Glenn Coomer called them. He said, turn that thing around and come back, we're going to give you a retirement party at Rocky Mount on 40, because they had just built a new factory in the industrial park. <laughs> And they want, Dad wanted to retire from that factory, so he turned the bounder around and he came back to Rocky Mountain. When he got there, everybody was wearing Walter Hughes shirts. They had the bounder behind him and a fishing rod in his hand. <laughs> so, <clears throat> let me see if I can figure out where I'm at. I'm sorry. In 1995, Dad had triple bypass surgery. In 96, Jimmy Holmes, called me and he told me that Fleetwood needed me. I was at Morgan Driveway's corporate headquarters. I had climbed up to manager administration under Terry Russell and the board of directors loved me. I was their golden boy. Jimmy told me that I had turned down Fleetwood twice and they had a Walter Hughes rule. They wouldn't normally give you a second, I mean a third opportunity to turn them down. So he presented it that I could either go to Douglas, Georgia or Lumberton, North Carolina, Pembroke, North Carolina. So I got home and I told my wife what was happening. And she asked me where and I told her. She said, get me out of Indiana. <laughs> I went to work in Pembroke under Tom Satterwhite and Jimmy Holmes. I worked 
for Fleetwood for 11 and a half years in three different factories. When Sydney grew up, she was involved in theater. And if you were here for Mob Memorial Service, you know that she can sing. Dad always said that she got her voice from him because when he was in heaven and they were handing out voices, he said, save mine for Sid because he couldn't sing. <laughs> Dad ad adored Sydney because as mom would tell you, she looked just like her and she is a teacher. In many ways, she's like her papa. She was the perfect child and she loves to read. Dad devoured books. He always said to invest in yourself and you would get the greatest returns. He and Jennifer are the only people to read all four of my manuscripts. In 1996, I was at Fleetwood Homes in Pembroke, North Carolina, and we lived in Lumberton. And when Sarah was born, Dad and Mom loved that we were in Lumberton. It was on the way to family in Georgia and Florida. They dropped by often in their bounder, and they loved that we moved into a cul-de-sac where he could easily turn around and back into my driveway. <laughs> Dad called Sarah his sports model. She was always doing something. She was the most generous child you ever met, and she always protected the weak. Boys who were twice her size did not stand a chance. As Dad watched her and Sydney playing in my yard, he looked at me and said, it was half as hard to raise you and your brother as one daughter. <laughs> so, I took that into under advisement since I now had two. I've ended up with three, thank God. God knew what he was doing. When she grew up, Dad helped her finance a car. I was like, Dad? He goes, there's no risk with Sarah. She worked harder than anybody I know. And so he was right. She had, he was very proud of her work ethic. In 2004, Jennifer and I were building a home in Paducah, in Kentucky. We had been rent, renting a home on Kentucky Lake, and it's in a fishing area, so as the season came into place, the uh, owner doubled the rent. We were months away from getting into our home, and Mom and Dad bought us the Bounder. So we had the Bounder to live in for a few months while we finished up. We moved in on Christmas Eve. But in September of that year, Hannah was born and she came home to the bounder. <laughs> Mom and Dad, when they, uh, tr when they worked for Fleetwood, they measured time by the number of moves. When they retired, they measured time by the number of states they saw in the bounder and their grandchildren, and then their great-grandchildren. Hannah checked off two of those. <laughs> in 2014, I was at the Louisville show, uh, the first display was the Fleetwood Homes of Tennessee display. And as I walked in, the guys that were there, they told me there's somebody looking for you in the front of this single wide. So I walked into the single wide and in the front was Charlie Lott. He was in there with Joe and he was the president of Fleetwood at the time. And Joe Stagmeyer, the CEO and chairman of the board of Capco Industries. And Charlie introduced us and we briefly discussed uh, Jim Clayton's new book where Joe Stagmeyer was featured. And Charlie asked me if I was ready to go home. Now a little aside, I had moved 34 times at this point in my life. When people ask me where my home is, I just tell them it's wherever my wife is. So when Charlie said that to me, I didn't know where he was talking about. Then he turned to me and he says, Terry, I need you to go save your father's factory. And I asked him what he needed. He said, I need a salesman. My dad was fond of telling me that I married a woman just like my mother. <laughs> I was not fond of it when he was telling me 30 years ago, but I've come to be more fond of it as years have gone by. I went home and I told Jennifer what Charlie had said. And she said, I will move with you one more time. <laughs> but this is the last move, come what may. But unlike my mother, she added a proviso. She said, if we have to move again, I'm choosing. <laughs> so anyway, Charlie did not get where he was at by missing an opportunity. He hammered home the clothes with, Terry, I need you to save your father's factory. 
In, 19, in uh, 2014, on April the 14th, I went to work for Fleetwood in Rocky Mount, Virginia. It took me five years to sell my house. And Steve Collins, if he's here, he was kind enough to help me to travel back and forth. I spent a week in the factory, a week on the road, and two days home. And everybody knows that absent makes the heart grow fonder is absolute BS. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it took five years to sell our home. And finally, in 2009, Jennifer and Hannah joined me in Rocky Mount. And we built a Fleetwood Modular. <clears throat> and Jennifer made it a refuge for mom and dad. Jennifer lost her father two years before we were married, and Dad was her father for 30 years next month. Dad would come up with reasons to have Hannah come visit. He'd call her up and say, Hannah, I need my boat washed, and then he would have her wash the boat, and then he would teach her how to drive it. He would call her up and say, we have Uncle Walter's kayaks. Do you want to take them out to the island? <laughs> Anything to get her down to the aisle. After Mom died, Jennifer would cook Dad's favorite meal and have him over. She would say, Papa, I have black-eyed peas and cornbread. You want to come over and eat some? And of course he did. We fixed Dad his first birthday meal without Mom. Had cheesecake and a cupcake with a candle on it. And for Father's Day, we took him down to the lake to celebrate. And when Jen and I celebrated our birthdays, we invited, invited Dad over. This past year, Dad would call and say, son, can I come by and see my Hannah? Or he would call and say, son, I'm tired. Can I come by and rest? He would sit on our couch, drink a glass of iced tea, and visit. It was a privilege to have, have him in my home. Jennifer adored him, and she made his, that home a refuge. And last, last night, she was Switzerland. The man I knew was a humble man. He did not have overnight success, but he was rewarded because he put others ahead of himself. He told me that if I recognized the finger of God, I would see his hand in everything. All the suffering that Dad saw over the years drove him to think of his associates. <clears throat> he loved to see them succeed, even if they left Fleetwood. In one of the last years of Dad's life, a nurse at the VA that took care of Dad was an ex-Fleetwood associate. Dad would drive by the plant. He'd look at the plant, he'd call me up and say, son, you need to ship some homes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody would come in and say, hey, I just saw your dad. <laughs> so I'd run down the hall and he'd be in Jimmy Holmes, I mean, in, I'm sorry, Jim Trapinski's office, my general manager, and Jim would wave me away. And I thank Jim for that. So one day I asked Dad, I said, Dad, why would you do that? He said, son, I quit working for Fleetwood 25 years ago, but I still work for him in my dreams. <laughs> he said, I want to make sure my people are taken care of. And I know if Jim is in here, I thank you so much for what you did these last few years. Thank you. Jessica, I'm one of the grandchildren, um, and something that I found out uh, when reading Papa's obituary was that the year I was born, he retired. Um, so as uh, similarly to Harry said, I never knew Conrad Hughes, I never knew Walter Hughes, I only ever knew Papa. Um, Mama and Papa's house on the lake was a very special adventure when we were 10. Um, I don't remember much because when we would come and visit at first, I was just very uh, itty bitty. Um, <laughs> the big hoopla for 
uh, my siblings and I was seeing Mama and Papa's gas station. Uh, most of y'all passed it on your way to get here. And uh, when we passed that, we knew that we were almost there and we're so happy. Uh, for me, it meant cookie cutters, swimming, fishing, and uh, having a little hidden tunnel behind the couch, um, uh, which I got to enjoy the grandma's hidden tunnel with my nephew just yesterday. Um, and I loved it. When I was around five, we permanently moved to Franklin County. Um, and that started a childhood where my grandparents were just next door. Um, the second phone number I ever memorized was for them uh, to give them a call to come over to dinner, uh, just to check in, see who's taking who to church. Uh, and if you haven't caught on by now, uh, it was always Mama and Papa. Uh, this past year, I've thought a lot about that. Especially since Papa seemed to suddenly become his own man again when Mama died. Um, all the stories, charisma, and sass were on full display for all of us. Um, I've realized that Papa was a man who loved and showed love by being present and listening. Uh, with Mama, Papa was the quiet comedic commentary that brought the laughter and love to their bickering. He was always there to make sure she had everything she needed to share her love and her light. Uh, she was the one that had those cookie cutters and taught us all of this, that, and the other. And Papa was there to support her. Uh, for us grandkids, Papa looked out for us and made sure we were safe and provided for. Mama did the talking, but Papa gave us the rides on the boat, and for Johnny and I, let us sleep in and go to the 11 o'clock church service, <laughs> and then uh, run away when Dad and Mom kept talking. Uh, he cooked us delicious pork butts and ribs, and uh, tried his best to help us if we needed any tinkering or projects for school. Uh, he was always working on something, as you said, and um, he was always buying new gadgets to make things easier for all our families. Like Pam said, when Mama was watching uh, the, the shopping channel, she had to be careful. She said, oh, that looks like it might help. Next thing you knew, he had it. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, vacuum. Vacuum. Heard a lot about the air fryer this year that uh, was purchased for Mama. Um, but he always encouraged us to explore and travel. And as Pam said, the only caveat was had to share that flight information. Um, and for all the love that he shared, Papa knew his mind, and he didn't feel the need to pretend. He told you like it was. And once dinner was done, if he wanted to go home, he was gone. <laughs> I'm glad to know it was a family trait, Harry. <laughs> Guess he took after his mom. Uh, he would try new things and humor you for a little bit, but if Mama wasn't on board, neither was he. When I was in high school, my mom started seminary, and my dad would travel a lot for Rotary. <clears throat> Johnny and I had a number of nights where we were home alone, and Mama and Papa uh, would check in on us. We'd have dinner. And one time, because I was like, OK, uh, I guess Papa took the reins when you were around Tana. But I was like, we got, we got to get over there and make sure we're, we're having fun. So. We introduced them to the game of Bonanza. For those of you that don't know, it's a very silly game where you trade <coughs> beans. Uh, very childish, but both uh, he and Mama humored us and tried it out. I don't know if they enjoyed it, 
But Mama would sweet talk Papa into trades, convince him to gang up on Johnny because Johnny was always cheating. And uh, I guess you all can figure out who won all those games. Mama with a very satisfied grin. I have lots of stories, and I take after my mama and will wander off like wander off and have anecdotes just like her, but uh, I really think this year was Papa's victory lap. Like Pam said, Mama gave him the space to go, be present, to talk to all of his people, to tell us stories, and show us a little extra love. <coughs> My last call with him I had sent him a text message to say I was thinking about him, and he responded a whole three words, um, and then I gave him a call. And we talked for a whole 15 minutes. Wow. Which, if any of y'all know, I was like, I got off that phone and I said, wow, Papa loves me. <laughs> um, so, this year, like Pam said, he didn't want us to cry, but now he's not here, so we can all cry. <laughs> um, but <laughs> he really taught taught me that you show up, you help people out, you give them your love, you take care of them, and you listen. And uh, if someone else is doing all the talking, just make sure you get a clever marking remark in there every so often. So, thank you all for being here and for those of you that knew Conrad and those of you that knew Walter, I know all of us were blessed to have him in our lives. Y'all stand as we sing this together. celebrated the life of Walter Conrad Hughes and as a pastor I have just a few words to say doesn't really mean short <laughs> but I will try to make it short because these stories have truly celebrated the life of Walter Hughes. He was very special to me. He and Yvonne, they were some of the first members here at Union Hall. 
And you remind me a lot of his dad. And even as I heard more stories, reminded me even more. And so I have to say, for Pamela and, and Terry for sharing, and for Jessica, uh, having lost my dad last month, uh, I knew what it takes to be able to share, but thank you for sharing. I can remember about three or four months ago, we were in Connect Group, and we were talking about how I needed to get a ceiling fan installed in our kitchen. It was wired to it, but we never did pick out the fan. So he said, well, let's just, we're going to do that. And Walter overheard me. He says, okay, well, I can help you. I'll bring the ladder. I'll bring everything we need, and I'll get up there, and I'll help you install it. And he had just gotten out of the hospital. Um, and because he, he was just right in there. I never saw him quit. Um, and I thanked him for that. And I said, well, we're still trying to decide. But he was so willing to help always ready to do up till the very end you know so often when you look at the sports world there are those athletes that just keep trying to go they may retire and then they come back and they retire and then they come back continue to try to go as long as they can and be strong and we all try to do that but i believe ball walter was so successful. And so here in the stories, when I was listening to the stories with his kids, the Lord brought me to a word that Paul shared to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, here it is, Paul writing. He had lived a long life. God used him in tremendous ways. He finds himself now in a dungeon and writing these words to encourage his young pastor friend, Timothy. And it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my, my, my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. And I want to just share a few things about what does it take to finish strong? I believe because of his relationship to Jesus Christ, a person who finishes strong is confident in the face of death. See, Paul used that term departure as a picture of death. It can be an army term, meaning to break down the tents, leave camp. And Paul saw himself as a man on a journey, heading for that next stop. And I think Walter saw that too. He began that journey when he left a farm, became a part of the Navy, see the world. Didn't know he was going to have his name changed, but it stuck. But he also, Paul also described death as at home with the Lord, game with Christ, falling asleep in Him. You know, death is a reality that must be looked squarely in the eye. We're all going to face it. But see, only Jesus Christ has that victory, that key to victory over death. We celebrated this truth just a few weeks ago on Easter. He conquered death when he rose from the grave 2,000 years ago. Because Jesus Christ lives, he offers to everyone the opportunity to overcome death. You see, we know in that verse that everyone knows, for the most part, or have heard or seen signs held, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We know God loves us. We are his creation. He loves us so much that he gave his son. And out of that gift of his son, we have the opportunity to believe that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again. And if we believe, then we receive that forgiveness and that gift of eternal life. 
You see, Walter found that. And he understood what that meant. What that new life was all about, having that relationship with the Lord. Because he saw that with his family, his parents, all of his kinfolk. But in finishing strong, there's also having a concentrated life. A concentrated life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ results in a focused, centered life. Paul's looking here in the rear view mirror in verse 7 where he says, I have fought the good fight. That word fight comes from a word which we describe the word agency as a picture of an athlete in a contact sport leaving it all on the field, giving everything he has. It's his total effort. And I, for the time I knew him, Walter gave everything. The stories that I heard, he never cut corners. There were no shortcuts, nothing halfway. He gave everything. <clears throat> And I, and I heard how he wanted at Fleetwood to build safe and great homes. He helped establish the Virginia Manufacturing and Modular Housing Association in order to bring integrity in the industry. And when he saw that there was a lack of skilled workers, he worked with the vocational schools to better prepare workers. He was also being instrumental and the creation of what's now the Jarrow Center. You see, he's described as having three key qualities, honesty, integrity, and justice. Paul also, in that verse, concentrated on completing his work, said, I have finished the race. Paul always kept his objectives in front of him. In Acts 20, 24, he said, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He gave really all the glory to the Lord. He really didn't seek it, though it was heaped on him. But he always turned it to the Lord. He started well and he finished well. I believe even in his retirement, he continued to make this community better. And finishing strong also means playing by the rules. Paul said, I have kept the faith. Athletes in the Greek Olympic Games, they took an oath to compete with honesty and integrity. Keep, in, keep the faith is keeping faithful to one's commitment to Christ. The person who finished strong is the person who keeps the faith. You know, now modern culture knows little of this kind of life. People, churches, denominations tend to change to suit what is current with the culture so they can relate. Well, one thing I learned about Walter especially at this time in our men's Bible study. He knew the truth from God's Word, and he didn't waver from it. He knew what was taking place in the culture, and he firmly <laughs> held to those truths and did not waver. Which also, and that was also true to where he became a part of this church. You probably know the story, I shared it last year, that Yvonne, having been in Methodist churches throughout their life together, she wanted to get back to her Baptist roots. And she said, if this little church here, that they're going to be open, and if it's a Baptist church, we're going to be there. As I already said, Walter said yes. And so when he came, he became a part of this church. But he knew as part of a Baptist that we believed in baptism by immersion. Not that it saves you, but it's symbolic of our faith following the example of Jesus Christ. When he saw that in Scripture and knew that, he willingly submitted 
to be baptized. And what a great celebration that was when he did. I think I've never seen a greater smile in Yvonne's face than that time. But they were so active and loved. But also in being a strong finisher, you contemplate the future. And that's what Paul did, verse 8, where he said, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. That crown which Paul writes about really is that laurel of leaves formed into a wreath and presented to the victor in athletic events. Paul affirmed that that day, the day of the Lord's return, at that judgment seat of Christ, he will receive this reward. It's a reward the Lord will present not only to Paul, but to all who loved his appearing, to all those who believed. You know, finishing is a rare, valuable commodity. Completing the task. I can walk in my basement and I can see tasks started, but incomplete. But for Walter, he saw to complete the task, staying until that final whistle. Never walking away, never pulling back, never drifting, never waffling, faithful to the end. I mean, when I saw him in the hospital this last time, just really a few weeks ago before Easter, we were talking about having a press. I I'm praying that you're going to be able to be here on Easter. And he was. He didn't want to miss it. You see, the world is looking for men and women who finish strong. Today, as we admire and celebrate Walter and his faith, I believe it's time, too, to examine our own journey in life. Is there anything in our life, our attitude, that maybe we need to change or make? Is there anything that's really not settled with us in our relationship with Jesus Christ? Where is our life headed? Can we be like the writer of Hebrews who wrote these words in Hebrews 12? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. We should make it a priority of our lives to finish strong. You know, I think, as I reflected on his birthday, June 21st, <laughs> that is the day that has the longest daylight. And that's so appropriate for Walter to be born on that day, to continue to do all God had for him because that's the day with the most daylight. You see, Yvonne, they both, he and Walter, they both loved the Lord, prayed before the meal, and then I believe kissed at the end. Yep. <laughs> and they had a great spiritual heritage. Their parents were faithful, <coughs> strong leaders in the church. And so that's what I want to ask you to consider. When you hear about Paul and the race, I have here a baton that in a marathon, in that relay event, you have one runner that's running and then hands that baton off to that next runner who then goes to that next runner. That baton of faith has been passed down Walter's parents to Walter and to his kids. And then I want to say also to the grandkids and great king grandkids, are you willing to pick up this baton and continue that life of faith in Jesus Christ to be used what God has called you to be? 
Because I believe God has great things in store for this huge family. He has already used you in so many ways and blessed you in so many ways. And I pray, would you continue that spiritual heritage, teaching your children about the Lord and having a relationship with Him. Walter's going to come and have prayer. And then we will have presentation of the flag. Well, before I pray, I have a few words. <laughs> um, I was closer to mom growing up. And I got to know dad when I became a father. And here's my go-to for wisdom and knowledge in, in anything. Uh, King Solomon in uh, 1 Kings asked God for an understanding heart, which really means wisdom. And we call it spiritual wisdom because dad knew the things of this world, but he also knew the wisdom that, that came from, from the Lord. And dad shared that wisdom with me because I asked him, I said, dad, I've never been a father before. How, how do I become a good father? And he was an ace mechanic from his days in the Navy. And so if you ever had anything that didn't run, Dad could fix it. And he taught me about plumbing because the kids loved the upstairs bathroom, and it was right above the uh, front door. And there was plastic knobs that went on the uh, faucets for that tub, and it would leak and come down into the front door. And so I learned how to plumb with Dad on the phone. <laughs> and the neighbor next door giving me the tools to uh, fix the plumbing, and he always taught me uh, buy two handle because the one will break and you'll have one to fix it as soon as it happens. So I began to understand him better uh, being in, in, in his shoes. And we came next door in 99 so that they had moved all over uh, America, but now they could have their grandchildren next door. And it meant all the world. And I joined Rotary to spend time with Dad. I said, well, this is a chance I can just have a little bit of time driving to and from Rocky Mount. And I really thought I was having breakfast. And what I learned is those conversations to and from were so special. And I realized that Rotary is something that impacted Rocky Mount, but it impacts the world. And he encouraged me to start my journey uh, with a water purifier at a district conference. And so it was one of those things that Dad fell in, in love with Fleetwood and Rocky Mount, but he fell in love with the people <clears throat> of Rocky Mount. And you meant so much to him. And so he gave his heart to this community. He wanted people to be employed. He wanted kids to know how to have a vocation. He wanted uh, middle school kids to understand about STEM so that they had science and, and technology that they may pursue those kind of careers. And he was proud of our kids for all that uh, they did to pursue science and engineering and so many creative things. So he wanted employee, he wanted associates for Fleetwood who were trained. And so that's why he spent so much of his effort with the public school system here, making sure that uh, the people had a education. And Dad had the gift of encouragement. And part of what he wanted was people to fall in love and have the family that he had. And so, so many people have come up to me and said, he celebrated my engagement in, in my marriage. And he was very active in church and uh, community. But what I want to tell you is his grandparents were faithful people and his parents were faithful people. And uh, Papa, my Papa, served the people of Homerville and Argyle, Georgia. And so Dad followed in his shoes. And he served the people of Franklin County. 
And I was Walter Hughes' son when I moved to Franklin County, and I got involved. And so I was honored to be Walter Hughes' son because he was a great man. And after a while, he told me, now I have become Walter Hughes' father. But he cared about not the outward appearance of somebody. <laughs> he cared about the character of your heart and the person that, that you were. And so that specialness that Dad had, he cheered on everyone. And I strive to live up to the example of my parents and my grandparents before me. And I'm hoping that I'm able to fill their, their shoes. And he's left a big hole here in Franklin County. And the Hughes name is well respected and loved because mom and dad were loved. And I see all of you here and you have a special place in dad's heart because he, he loved you so. And I want to thank you for taking the time to come and honor him and listen to all the stories. And I'm the quiet one of the family. <laughs> and so I give thanks that he set the example to love God and to love others. And I also give thanks to God that he was my father and I was his son. Let us pray. Dear Princess Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this man, Walter Conrad Hughes Sr., who is known as Walter and was Conrad and Papa and friend and neighbor and the encourager. Uh, we give you thanks that Mom and Dad are united again. And Dad is listening to all the stories that Mom have found out while she was uh, there without him. And so they've caught up, I hope. But Dad, I'm sure, has found a quiet place uh, that he can get away and just kind of listen to the Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for uh, taking him into your grace and knowing that he is with you and that he is so proud of each one of his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And we give you thanks for the family that he has made that is blood and the family that is made in Christ. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we have come and celebrated the life of your faithful servant, Walter Conrad Hughes, Sr., who loved you more than anything else, who loved his country and served this country, who loved this community and served this community, who greatly loved his family and did all that he can for his family. He lived a great life, a tremendous legacy. He was faithful to the end. So, Father, as we go, it is our prayer that we will cherish those memories of his love and his faithfulness. And may we honor those in our life as we seek to continue to be faithful servants for you. For Walter Jr., for Terry, for Pamela. Father, I pray for them and their families. May they continue that legacy, that example set before them. Comfort them, strengthen them, and bless them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could ask for the immediate family, if you could, to stand and follow me out, and then those can have a chance to talk with you. Thank you. think he's hearing well done by good and faithful service right about now? I could. And I think Christ is probably saying, well done by a good and faithful servant. Yeah. Amen. And Walter's saying, Uncle Garner's saying, where's Yvonne? Yeah. <laughs>